So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to my session about manage and deploy your site with Rush. Um, let us first begin. Who am I? Uh, my name is Bastian. Um, I work with Amazing Labs in Zurich. Uh, you find me on Drupal.org under Das Recht, also on Twitter and on Facebook and everything. Um, I'm also the DevOps chair, the track chair, so I organized all the talks you hear during this DrupalCon um, in the DevOps track. And as job description, I'd like to point out I'm from the fuck it, we do it live operations. So if there's no DevOps, we do that. So for this afternoon, I give you a small introduction into the Rush Deploy. Where are we today? Where do we want to go with Rush Deploy? I will cover everything that you need to put the things together because it's not just drop a module in, s flip a switch, and then get going. And I will also cover um, some parts on Drupal 8, how it does work, what's currently broken, whatnot. So, um, where are we today? So, currently, a lot of people are using third party frameworks like. Capistrano or Edefix, you probably know them. So who uses Capistrano by a show of hands? Some. Who use something different? Okay, good. So there are currently a lot of deployment strategies. Like we deploy on one server, then we are sync to all other servers and hope nothing breaks. There are some who use custom bash scripts, by which I usually relate to um, duct tape deployment because it could break in some points, it will not break, it's not the perfect way. There are also a deployment strategy which you probably know of from years ago, which was FTP upload. Yes, that still exists. We still have customers which say, yeah, we want to host on our server. It's really fancy, it's fast, and you get an FTP account. It's like, okay, that works. You can do it, but no. Um, and there's also um, just checking it out on the live servers, do a git pull and pray that everything runs through. Yeah. Can you please close the door? Thank you. So, some words about Drush Deploy. The main maintainer is Mark Sonnabaum. I don't know if he is here yet. Yell if you are. Give a nice hand to that guy in the back. He did a great work on this. So... Um, the whole Drush Deploy is ins heavily inspired by Capistrano, and there hasn't been much movement since uh, the whole Drush Deploy has finished because it has any functionality we currently need. So there is not a lot of things we just need to add. So it supports just Git, which is okay for what we use, and it needs PHP 5.3 at least. So there will be some changes for making it PHP 5.4 ready. That's also in the making currently. So something else to deploy. Who knows about cluster SSH? Who loves it? Okay. So I refer to that one as that's the DevOps way to kill five servers with one keystroke because you run one command on several servers and you do an remove directory and you find out, oh, that was the wrong directory. And you successfully trashed your life environment. Doesn't happen. Um, yeah, where do we want to go? So the idea behind Rush Deploy is to use a tool we own, all know by heart, which is Rush. So we also want to do multi-server deployments. So not any site is deployed on just one server. For Amazing Labs, we have around five web servers. And not all sites are running on the same server. So we don't want to deal with the burden to make everyone, everybody, uh, everybody uh, aware that, yeah, on which server are those clients deployed. We just want to do a Drush uh, deploy at live, and it should know automatically what's done. We also want to run tasks like updating DBs, running custom scripts, um, doing monitoring things, like automating everything that you could probably miss out. We also want to remote cache all the Git things. So we want to have a speedy deployment without needing to check out a 
150 megabyte uh, Git rep repository m multiple times and trying something like that. And we will also have the possibility to roll back a release. So if something fails, we want to go back one step. We use this sometimes when you try to enable uh, HTTPS, for example. You do some changes and then something is missing and you see, oh, there is one side which on, on a customer side which behaves a little bit differently and we need to roll back now. And you just can roll back then with Drush Deploy. So as a small conclusion, we try to sneak in a little bit more automation, which leaves then less room for human error. So look at your future deployment. Guess like this. We run Drush Deploy, at live, and hit enter. And actually, that's a pre-recorded yesterday because I didn't want to do it live now because when I need to fix a site during a talk with a packed room, I don't like it. it and it adds a little bit of stress. So what you see, it first loads all the alias web servers, then it starts to deploy, and then it checks out all Git submodules. It does magic to the submodules, and some seconds afterwards, we have deployed. Easy, isn't it? And we also have a nice little message on the hip chat which says, hey, I deployed a site for a customer. So that said, I tried to enable all team members to deploy to live. There is no need for me to, de to do a deployment because when I get sick, no deployment is happening, so everybody should be able. And you should really strive to the way that you can enable all team members to deploy. So that happened. I told uh, two people from our sister company, Amazing Metrics, how to deploy with Thrush Deploy. They did it. And five minutes afterwards, the CEO came to my desk and asked, yeah, that's really nice, and we like that you do that, but what if they break it? And I told, yeah, they can break it, but we can also fix it because we can roll back. So you need to calm down some people sometimes. So now back to me. Should we put all parts together to see what's needed to do a Drush deploy? Of course. So we start with installing Drush deploy, we then cover a bit of the Drush aliases. So actually, who uses Drush aliases? Good, very good. So afterwards, we will then cover the Drush deploy configuration, and we will do our first deployment, like running through what it would do. So installing Drush deploy is rather easy. We just run, we just go to the Drush directory, which is in your home directory. You git clone the actual branch, and you run a drush cc drush. After running then a drush uh, command without any arguments, you should see that there are now the drush deploy actions. So that's quite easy. Now we need to get the Drupal sites ready, which is a task when you have more than one site, could be a little bit tedious in the end, in the beginning. So. We need to do some standardization. We need to clean up all our environments. You need to establish some standards for, let's say, configuration. You need to have like a settings local.php as Drupal 8 does it. You can also incorporate this in Drupal 7. I will have some code snippets afterwards. You need to standardize your file paths, your web root paths. So actually, you need to have a setup that every customer sites look almost the same. Why? Because it eases your workload when you need to change something over all customers you host. So what we do, we have the settings PHP committed to, um, to our Git repository. And in the end, we just check if there is a settings local.php. And if it's there, we just load that when you load the site. So that eases us a little bit that we just have the site-related settings in the settings local. It gives you a better overview. And all configurations you will have 
in your standard setup are committed to the repository. So you don't need to change anything there. What we also do, we do, we move the settings local.php to a directory which is accessible from every server. So you just change it once and you run a deployment and it's deployed on every server. But we still copied the file to have like in every revision, in every deployment you do, there is the settings that local that PHP, which is exactly from that revision, that you know that you can go back and you have the old file again. So that's nice, but we also need the aliases. So some of you know the aliases already. Aliases is a way to tell Drush how your environment looks like. You can say that there is a web server one. You can give a web root, a remote user, and a remote host. So Drush automatically knows by running a command at web one on which server it should connect. You can also say web two is the same as web one, but the remote host is web2.example.com, which is really easy. So what does this enable us? We can run Drush at web one user login. Will take some time. Drush makes an SSH command to the server. It runs a ULI and it gets back to one time user login URL to your shell. So that's nice. You can also run a Drush SQL sync from Web1 to your devo default environment and you get back to data. That's also something we, we use regularly because it eases the way you can move data around. You don't need to dump it and copy the file, you just SQL sync it and you need to know on which server. But usually we use the web server one for connecting to the uh, MySQL server and getting the data back. So that's about aliases. I will go a little bit deeper on aliases afterwards because we evolved the setup which um, we use for Drush Deploy a little bit over the last two months. So I will have this somehow split in two parts. It's the part which I describe how to set up it easily and how we do currently the deployment stuff. So Drush Deploy configuration. There is um, Drush de deploy.drushrc.php, which has a lot of information in it how Drush Deploy knows what to do. So First, you need to know, Drush Deploy needs to know where the deploy repository is. So you just fill in your deployment repository and you say which branch it should deploy. I personally strongly suggest that you adopt somehow a Git workflow. We at Amazing Labs use uh, Git Flow, which has it started out that we just wanted to do it and then we tried to incorporate Rush Deploy and say, okay, now we need to do it. So what brings Gitflow to the table? Um, it's one of many branching models, so I don't say it's the right branching model, but it works fine for us. So we have a live and a dev branch. The live branch, nobody ever commits directly into the live branch. So all merges to the live branch are done by pull requests or manual merging. There is also the way to, um, to use feature branches that you create a from life, a from life you create a branch which has the feature number, you develop on it and you merge back to the live. There's also hotfix branches which I personally use quite often if I need to fix something fast, so I go from live, do the hotfix, and get back to live. So that's what I. And one important thing: live is always deployable. There is nothing like, oh yeah, we shouldn't deploy live because mm, it will break some small things. That's not going to happen, because if you have that, you will not be able to automate it. Because when you have a live branch which you can put your hand down and say, okay, we can deploy it at any given time. You gain some confidence to just run Drush deploy at life and it will run through and the site will not go down. So that's something you need to do. There's something else in the um, deploy.drushrc.php, the keep releases. Keep releases tells Drush deploy 
how many release directories it should keep. So that's the steps you can go to roll back. Like when you have 10, you can go back 10 steps in deployments. If you have just one, you can just go back one. Um, actually, it's not cleaning up automatically. So when you run the cleanup, uh, there is Drush Deploy Cleanup, it will remove everything that's over that threshold. So that's something also worth mentioning. And if you use git submodules for having the modules, you need to tell it git enable submodules to true, that it knows that it, it needs to check out your submodules, unless you will have uh, Drupal ciphers as submodules. The next thing is the file system structure, which is quite a bit different to what you usually do for deployment. So you can prepare your server by running Drush Deploy Setup at Web1, and this will create you different directories. It will uh, create exactly that directory structure without the uh, public HTML. The public HTML is what we use, so we have for every website a user and a public HTML directory, which is either a folder or a symlink. So Puppet, when it runs through and it sees, oh, it's not there, it creates a folder. And if there is a symlink or already a folder, it does nothing. So in the current directory, that's a symlink to the latest release. So the current directory always links to a release folder. And we have the releases, which is um, a folder which is created for every time you run Drush Deploy. So you run Drush Deploy, it starts to create one of those folders. After it's done, it will link to public HTML. No, it will uh, link the current directory to the release directory, and then the deployment is done. We also have a shared directory, which has a cached copy of your whole code. So it does the git checkout. The git pull is all always done there. And then from there, we copy it over. I will cover that later. And we have the public HTML, which always links to the current directory. And the current directory always links to the latest release. So you see that's a chain of symlinks, which is probably not optimal, but it's currently the way we go. So what exactly happens when we run Drush Deploy at Web1? It goes to every web server. It updates your remote cache, like the shared directory I told you. It initializes and updates the submodules. So you have always the same, the, the right version in it. So And it does it, it does it in a harsh way. So it just trashes everything that's not as it's described in Git, so you are sure that you have the right versions. It creates a new release directory and copies over your code base to the release directory. It then links the current directory to your uh, current deployed code and executes the tasks we define. If something goes wrong, you can run a Drush deploy rollback and you will get back to the web uh, to the latest release so it will just switch the symlink as it does for capistrano for example so you now tell me yeah that's nice but what's about drush deploy at life so for multi server deployments there is alias lists who uses them yeah you of course you invented it somehow <laughs> um well um, Drush enables you to tell Drush there is an alias, live, and you can give it more servers as we just defined them at Web 1 and Web 2. And Drush then knows that it's a group of servers. So you cannot do every command with it. You could do a Drush ULI and it will go to every server and give you a one-time login link for every server, which is pointless. But for deploying, you can group the servers together. So that's nice, but I told about standardization, keeping the things together. We cover that. So if you don't know about a Drush alias thing, go to that URL, read through, be enlightened, 
because there are, are a lot of things you can have parent um, aliases which take the same data as the parent has. There are a lot of things which are not widely used, but they are there since years. So let's cover automated aliases. What we do currently is we create the alias files on the fly. So we have a file which stores how our servers are set up, and that's a JSON file, which is really easy to see. Like It's even open to the wild. It's on our GitHub account. So there is live is web server one, web server two, web server three with the IPs. And we try to build the server groups automatically. So our ali aliases file currently looks like this. We have a site name, which is the unique identifier to the sites. And from there, we can find out how the site should look like. And we also can override it in case of we want to overwrite something. If some site is currently just deployed on one server, we just change the JSON file for one customer, which then overwrites the standard configuration. You ask about the time to implement this. It was about one evening. We did it last year uh, at DrupalCon Prague. The whole team sat together for one evening. We went through all customer sites and moved to Rush Deploy in one evening was around, I guess, 40 clients, 50 clients. So you can do that quite fast. Deployment tasks. Um, you can run deployment tasks before or after moving to a new version. And you can also say if you want to do it on one or all servers. So a Drush CCL, you just want to run it on all servers because you will have quite a lot of time wasted when you run it on five servers, and it does the same. Also, something that's important to say, don't link settings files, copy them. We first linked the settings files all the time and then found out that it's probably not the best idea. Okay, we came across that idea at, at two o'clock in the morning, so linking the settings file was perfect. But when you try to roll back and you did a change to your settings file, you cannot roll back because it's a link. So don't do that. Copy settings files. Um, what are we doing with deployment tasks? We update and link settings local files because we, can we will copy it with any revision and link it inside the revi revision. So every deployment will be linked, but um, we have it copied, so it's also versioned. We will link the site's default files because we have it centrally stored on one of our NFS servers. We will run a Drush AppDB just on one server. We will run a Drush CCL also on one server. And in the end, we notify New Relic about the deployment, which then goes back to HipChat and informs the team that the deployment happened. That said, Having New Relic integrated with HipChat is a really cool thing because every, everyone is kept in the loop what's happening because any, anyone from the team knows that a deployment happens. So if you see a deployment coming in and New Relic, no, uh, PagerDuty afterwards calling you that there is something wrong with the site, you know who to tell and you know who to set on fire afterwards. So that's easy. But we talked about it and said, okay, we want to just have one aliases file. We sat down one weekend of work and it's currently not all rolled out yet, but we changed the way how we deal with the settings file, uh, the aliases file, excuse me. So we have just one file which has the site identifier in it and we have a, a set of JSON files files which define how live, the live server environment should look, how, for example, a staging environment should look like, and we can define per customer how it should be. It, it gives you complete flexibility, but it adds also a lot of complexity. So you need to think through it quite a lot until you get there and you know what to do. Uh, if you're interested in it, and if you're interested in seeing it, 
come to me afterwards, I can show you. It's currently not completely rolled out because we are dealing with some problems with overwriting um, environments because we started to have s for some, um, if you have like a feature release, we have feature servers, which like a dev server, which just has this feature on it. And people can like rush deploy this feature. So it's not perfect yet. Let's talk about missing things. So currently, we also have the thing that we just want to update code. We don't want to run an updb. We don't want to run something else. So there is a way to override the deployment tasks. But if you automate it in the way we did it, it's not that easy to just say, I don't want to do it. So my idea is that we have somehow an identifier on the deployment tasks to say, I don't want to do this set of deployment tasks. Currently, there are mandatory tasks, but I want to do something like, I want to do just the linking tasks, or that you have groups, something like that. Also something, if you work the way we do it, and you have a new user, a completely new created user, and you do the Drush deploy the first time, it will fail because trying to connect to GitHub forces you to type yes and enter, and because Drush deploy is automated, it will fail. There is a patch I wrote, which is not very nice. It just runs the command and does it, but it's not working for every so for everyone. So I want to do it a little bit more generically. There are also breaking things. So Drush changed in the recent weeks. So the discovery of Drush RC files changed, which leaves you behind with, you run Drush deploy and get a lot of errors and it is not working. So that's something I'm working currently on to make this work again, because it's, um, I don't know the, the exact uh, issue queue number, but Drush um, changed because Drupal changed a little bit. They want to discover the files which are for Drush just inside Drush and not inside default. So that uh, also gave, uh, gave, gave us some headaches. Drupal 8 changed, but less than beginning of the year. So Drush deploy should work fine with Drupal 8 now because we have the um, the configuration files, which are on live and imported, are not in the files uh, in the files anymore. They are in the database, so that was a bit easier. There is also one bug about per local warnings. They can ruin your day or break the deployment. So the deployment just stopped. I spend around four to five hours de debugging this because you just run the Drush deploy and it stops, and you don't give get any error back. And it was, I can run it all the time. My colleagues can run it sometimes. And it's just because some error passing isn't done the right way. And Rush Deploy isn't expecting it, and you are not expecting it either. So yeah. And who uses APC? OK. Um, the Rush Deploy is not nice to APC, because every time you change the sim link, APC sees, oh, there is new code, and starts to keep that in memory. So you end up in having your APC having old code, which is not used anymore in memory. That sucks. It sucks that much that you sometimes kill your production environment. We found out about this like rolled out Drush deploy on many sites. We did some deployments, and then suddenly things got worse. Like, you had problems that sites got slow. You had sites that just on one server we had 500 errors and something like that. And after seeing that, we found out that we should probably clear APC from time to time. How many sites are on that box? Is that um, APC yeah, no. I want to go bigger. Um, but my only point is that like, that probably isn't an issue for most people, because APC is just going to eject uh, once it gets full. Stuff it should. Right? Actually, a couple different APC settings that, that yeah. depend on how you do that. But Thank you for pointing this out. Yeah, as you told, APC should find out that, oh my god, I might share memories running full. But 
on that version we are running, there is some weird bug that if you hit like five megabytes of free space, it just starts going haywire and not cleaning itself out. It should, but it doesn't. So yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah, the thing is, uh, on our servers, we are bound to um, Ubuntu long-term service, so we can't just exchange things. So we are working on that too. Drupal 8. Um, there is a configuration management initiative. And as I told you, beginning of the year, there were two directories storing all your configurations. So you had either the live configuration, which is the configuration you currently use, and you had the staging configuration if you changed something to roll it out. They found out that the idea of having that is a good idea, but somehow it wasn't practical because you needed to copy files over and you couldn't version it because if someone works on the same view and commits it, the JSON, uh, the YAML file got somehow corrupted and your site broke. So the live configuration is now in database, which eases the deployment a little bit. The dealing with configuration files is also a little bit different, but as I told you in the talk, uh, when you incorporate the .local file, you're safe. Head is also moving quite fast, not as beginning of this year. It gets stable. It's more stable and it doesn't break that much. It should be a Drush deploy should work with Drupal 8. I did test it yesterday evening and it worked on our site, so you should be fine. Yeah, that's it. Some take home messages. Um, we started the Drush deploy adventure around one year ago. You don't need to do anything automa in automation at once. You can do little steps. Go with the aliases file first, then clean up the settings, clean up your environments, go to Drush deploy afterwards. You don't need to do anything at once. Because if you try to do this, it's a li little bit too much. Automatic alias files are awesome because you change, you move a site to another server, you just change um, in a JSON file, okay, it's now on server two, and you don't need to tell anyone because they run just Drush deploy and they Drush deploy knows that it's there. You also need to clean up your environments. That's something I do regularly, or I try to do it regularly because Things mess up sometimes. You just deploy a patch somewhere and you do something. And Drush Deploy really forces you to do, at least in the live environments, nice work that you don't deploy something just on live. So because on the next deployment when somebody does the right process, you just trash their changes. Standardization saves time. That's, I can leave that without saying something. It's just the way it is. And deployments are fun when you run them with Thrush Deploy because anybody can do it in the company. So, yeah. If you want to download the slides, you can go to s.nerdy.ch slash Thrush Deploy Amsterdam. And, yeah, that's it. I'll be here for a quick Q&A if you have some questions. Can you probably pass the mic somehow because it's all recorded and it's easier when people have it there. Um, can you specify uh, extra commands to execute per target? So just executing comments on one target? Uh, when, you, uh, when you deploy to a staging environment, I want yeah. to execute extra commands like enable the mail reroute module, etc. Currently not. That's also something you could try to do or is something we also want to do that module enabling disabling. Okay, thanks. Probably he can answer that question a little bit better. Yeah, so, uh, and, and that's a very, uh, very common uh, like sort of feature request that ended up in the, in the queue for Drush Deploy. And yes, like there could be a lot of Drupal specific tasks 
that you could add to it to do things like that. But you can still do all of it by just uh, creating an after task, like a creating a, a task like you showed, and then run it or set it to run before or after the deploy. But that uh, would run for every deployment. If he asks oh, specifically right. about like if I have a stage alias and I just deploy in stage, he just wants to run it for the stage, right. not so for the life. And, and, and it's common, I mean, I've, I used to do this in Capistrano all the time, where you have, I mean, you have your things that you're going to run on every deploy, but not every deploy needs the same tasks. Like, say, like rebuilding uh, node access permissions. You definitely don't want to run that, but sometimes you need to do it once. I don't think there's anything wrong with just make putting that in your file, uh, maybe committing it, running it, and then taking it out. Yeah. Because that's then you're documenting, I needed that for this deploy, and I don't need it anymore. Yeah, that's also a way. Other questions? No? Yeah. I can rephrase it. Um, I saw that you, um, the URL to the file share directory. Yeah. Uh, did you need to set that contingently across all areas? Or did I miss something? Um, yes and no. So he was asking if the path to the files directory needs to be set consistently. Yes, but it's a per site consistently. Yeah, because it's a per site. Yeah, because every, every site has a different configuration, so you can have it on every, on every site a little bit set, set a little bit different. Uh, that should work. Good question. Um, no, unless you do a Drush SQL dump before. So... What we are doing, when we, ha we have two types of deployments currently. One is when we can agree with the customer that they will have a staging server created two hours before and they have a content freeze. So we can just prepare everything on the staging and then move to databases. And if something is not all right, they will spot it on the staging. But rolling back, if you have a lot of user-generated content, that will create some pain for you. So, no, not yet. But you could uh, run a task to dump the database and then for the rollback unit just to keep it in. Uh, there's and one related thing about that, because uh, you showed the, how you can put tasks before and after. Yep. That's actually very much related to rollback. And so any task that's before, if it fails, that automatically triggers a rollback. Yep. So in the case where you deploy uh, it's already live, things are happening, and you need to roll back, then you're, you're in pain. But if you, if you have a bunch of tasks that are running in the database, and they're all in before hooks, as long as you, in the, uh, at the start of it, say, dump the database first, any of those can fail, and then you can still restore that, and then flip back. So the, the tooling is there for it. You just have to set that up yourself depending on how you need it done. Yeah, that's right. Um, he was asking about if we wanted to do stage deployment and using features. Um, yes, we thought about that. Um, we are using it for some sites that we run, we use features, but um, it heavily depends on the site. Sometimes if you just need to push out some code or some CSS changes, it's easier to just do it that way. Um, we also have something where our developers are working on which is kind of like features, but it's for it's easier to just code things and do the changes in in a updb hook. So we partially use that. Yes. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Well, he was actually asking also about uh, content staging. Content staging, right? Mm, no. So everything that needs to run stage so we have one customer which has like publishing of yearly results so we prepare everything on a staging environment and then copy it over to have a consistent state of everything so we don't use it yet yes
Mm, that's not related to to Drush deploy, in, uh, because Drush deploy just does the code side. The SQL sync is done still manually currently, but you could also do it. I guess there is a way to exclude tables from a sync. Yeah, SQL sync is not part of the game. So you can, you don't need to SQL sync, that's not mandatory. You can script it, but it's not mandatory. Other questions? Not? Okay, um, please rate my talk. I'm happy to have some feedback, and if there are questions or you want to see something, just come here. Thank you. Thank you.